As the standoff continues between the Saudi Arabia-led bloc and Qatar, we'll be asking if the latest diplomatic move from the U.S. has any chances of breaking the stalemate. And less than a year after China launched the world's first quantum communication satellite, are we any nearer to a completely unhackable communications network? Welcome to The Point. I'm Zhou Yue, sitting in for Liu Xin. The standoff between Qatar and a bloc of Arab countries led by Saudi Arabia has lasted for almost two months. There is still no sign of backing down on either side. On Monday, Qatar rebutted Saudi Arabia's accusations that it is internationalizing the Hajj pilgrimage, which begins in late August. And on Wednesday, the U.S. State of Sec Secretary of State uh, Tillerson said he has sent senior envoys to mediate in the Qatar crisis. So what can we expect from the second round of mediation by the U.S.? For more, I'm pleased to be joined in the studio here in Beijing by Li Guofu, Director of Middle East Studies at the China Institute of International Studies. And from Doha, we have Associate Professor Majub Zwery from Qatar University. Uh, let me start with you, Mr. Li. The annual Hajj pilgrimage to Islam's holiest cities in Saudi Arabia, for example, Mecca, will start later this month and last until September. And now, Qatar and Saudi Arabia accused one another of politicizing such uh, uh, religious uh, pilgrimage. What specifically do the countries mean by politicizing? Mr. Lee? I think you know, uh, when you know, the Saudi Arabia and has uh, you know, issued some of you know, the restrictions uh, of you know the Qatari to uh, join this uh, pilgrimage, and you know some of you know the NGO in Qatar they accused you know the Saudi Arabia and you know, use this uh, and the Hajj as a, a political you know the issues, and the, this is uh, you know the start of the debate between the two countries. Definitely. The Saudi strongly deny that he said that you know uh, there is uh, uh, if you know the Qatar say that you know this is a sort of you know politicalized you know the Hajj you know the Saudi said this almost equivalent something like uh, you know the Qatar launched a war between the two countries. And Mr. Zwari, are uh, these travel restrictions actually happened? Uh, before this year's Hajj pilgrimage. Do you think the Saudi Arabia is politicizing this? Look, the whole thing, um, uh, the environment is, is the political environment is re in the region is, is poisoned. So what I can, what I see is the following, that uh, from Doha uh, side, there was no politicization and no internationalization of the issue of Hajj. What has happened is that there are, there are some communications with a human rights organization on the issue of Hajj, basically highlighting that there is uh, some difficulties for 20,000 Qatari and residents mm. in Qatar to go to Hajj this year. That is the only thing uh, so far I observed. So basically that does not say that there is an internationalization or politicization. There is, you may call it complaint, you may call it complaint that, that you know, Qatar wants response. Mm. What is being said so far that uh, uh, had authorities in, in Saudi Arabia, there is no communication with their counterpart in Qatar. They, they are not really mm. uh, welcoming positively with them and they are not responding to the questions and to the queries from the Qatari side. So that is the main issue. So but basically still, you need Qataris sort of, can still um, travel to Saudi uh, Arabia by taking uh, to the know Saudi the numbers, air flights to know the hotels and, and to, all of this. to airports in Saudi Arabia. How restrictive it is for Qataris uh, if they really want to go to Mecca for the Hajj pilgrimage? It is not about only traveling. There is specific preparation should be done these days 
before m moving to the issue of airports. There is sort, the, sh the names should be communicated, the visa should be issued. There is no embassy uh, for Riyadh in Doha. There is no sort of diplomatic or someone who can take care of this um, uh, issue. So basically there is a procedures issue mm. which basically complicate the whole matter. And if there is no communication from the Saudi counterpart, of course, no, it, the, issue, the, the issue of flights is the last thing, mm. um, you know, any Hajj will think of it. Is, is, is the, the issue before that, that is more important. But the context is there is bad blood between Qatar and the Saudi Arabia-led uh, coalition. Uh, the Saudi Foreign Minister Ada Jubair said Qatar's attempt to politicize the pilgrimage is a declaration of war against the Saudi Arabia. Do you think this is just combatant rhetoric or there is real possibility of military conflicts between two Arab countries? This question to me? Yes, please. I, I want your take yeah. first to Mr. Um, Dewey and then Mr. As Mr. I said, the, no. I, I, as, as, okay, so I have not observed any politicization. I, that is what I said at the beginning of this interview. Now, what is being said by the Saudi foreign ministry, I have no idea. Uh, based maybe based on this communication about the difficulties that those 20,000 are facing, which is there is sort of communication with uh, uh, concerned uh, uh, organization, which is basically in such cases, in such situation, normally countries are, are contacting to solve their problems. But this cannot be a politicization at all, because basically no one, for example, called uh, for um, uh, uh, independent uh, body to look after the mm. Hajj. No one, for example, uh, undermine the Saudi authority and supervision on Mecca and Medina. So none, none of these things actually took place. So these are the things indicate that there is a politicization of internationaliza internationalization. As long as there is nothing of this, I don't think so. That this, this is a valid issue to speak about politicization. Mr. Lee, uh, what is your response to Saudi Foreign Minister's uh, words that this is actually a declaration of war? It's just empty threatening words or it means something substantial? I think this is the uh, first, you know, the Saudi Foreign Minister expressed, you know, the Saudi, you know, the official positions. Uh, you know, it means that, you know, Saudi is very serious today to take this matter. And uh, second, I think, you know, it is uh, to show that to the Qatar, you know, they are very serious about, you know, this issue, especially, you know, why, you know, some people say, you know, this, there was, you know, uh, internationalized or politicalized, you know, the mm. Hajj, because this is something, you know, Saudi is very uh, proud of that. Mm. If anything may be you know, changing, you know, the Saudi authorities on this issue, definitely, I think, you know, the Saudi's response will be very, very tough. So I, the other side, I don't believe, mm. you know, uh, there would be any, you know, you know, the military, and though, you know, there may be some problems uh, between the two countries, but it is uh, far away from what we but some people in a said. way, this uh, dispute has been internationalized. The U.S. Secretary of State Tillerson has asked two officials, including retired general and former Middle East envoy Anthony Zini, to work to end uh, the diplomatic crisis in the Gulf. Well, in July, Tillerson made a four-day tour to the Gulf countries and headed back to Washington without anything substantial on how to resolve this. Do you think the U.S. can and will mediate over the crisis as both sides are allies of the United States? Mr. Lee? I think, you know, if the U.S. is serious about that, and I believe the U.S. can do something, now, the problems we have is, you see that, you know, even, you know, the citizen, the uh, Secretary of State is trying very hard to, you know, to mediate these issues. But at the same time, we also see that, you know, Mr. Trump, you know, they speak very different from, you know, the citizens' positions. So I personally believe because of, you know, the Americans, you know, 
the different positions mm. between the White House and mm. the, you know the Secretary in uh, you know, a State Department that you know to make you know the years especially I believe that you know the mediator mm. is very doubtful for you know the both sides of you know the countries involved in this uh, uh, in a dispute. And Mr. Zwerry, do you think the U.S. Uh, maybe they cannot agree on how to deal with this? Can they be the mediator? What is your expectation? Look, this, the American position is, is very clear. American position, first of all, they are supporting the Kuwaiti mediation uh, by Sheikh Sabah, and they support this, uh, they, they, they have full support for this mediation. What has been done in the last two days that um, Tillerson has appointed two envoys to take care of this matter and to push toward a solution as early as possible. The two diplomats, basically, who will be in the region uh, sometime soon, they will be engaging with a, a sort of a debate between two uh, um, between the two parties and try to explain, you know, um, the whole matters and uh, and 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 the dangers of escalations. So I think America has interest to um, uh, de-escalate the whole thing. They, there is a strong interest to bring things to the normal as early as possible. Um, of course, we cannot deny that there is sort of um, uh, differences within the administration. Uh, maybe Trump is in favor of Saudi Arabia or basically he's not really um, uh, singing the same song which mm -hmm. Tillerson is, is, is repeating that um, uh, uh, countries should be, should be banned by international law and should uh, respect international okay. law. But at the end of the day, what, is, what has happened uh, confirms that uh, the, f the Department of State is now on board, and that is what makes Tillerson now uh, sending those two envoys. Okay. On that optimist note, uh, we have to end this part of the discussions. Thank you, Mr. Li Guofu, and thank you, Mr. Madhub Zawari from Qatar University. You're watching The Point. Don't go. We'll be right back. Less than a year after China launched the world's only quantum communication satellite, Chinese researchers have for the first time sent entangled photons from space to ground stations during the daytime, despite the huge amount of sunlight noise. But last month, some Chinese scientists teleported a photon from Earth to an orbiting satellite for the very first time. Now it is reported that an unhackable quantum communication network is to be launched in China by the end of August. So how important is that? And is China now taking a lead in the area to explore this mysterious technology? We are pleased to be joined in the studio by Zhang Fan, Associate Professor of Astronomy at Beijing Normal University, and Dr. Anton Zeilinger, a quantum physicist from Linz, Austria, and Seth Lloyd, a professor of mechanical engineering and physics at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, let me start with you, Mr. Zhang. It is said that a powerful computer can break the encryption of nearly every uh, computer communication, any coded messages. But with quantum encryption, that's no longer true because quantum communication is unhackable because any meddling with the message will change the message itself and trigger alarm. Is that the case? Uh, so I'll, I'll take this question, uh, try to explain it from a layman's point of view, because I am actually, that. I'm actually a layman on this, uh, in this field of research. Anton is the actual uh, expert. So if I say anything wrong, please correct me. Uh, <laughs> but from, uh, from a layman's point of view, 
it's basically a, an encryption method. So say if you want to send a message to me, a secret message through a courier, but for some reason in your world, the couriers are all very curious and they want to take a look at the message and you don't want it to happen. Uh, so what would you do? You would put the message in the box, lock it and send the locked box to me, right? Uh, and then the problem is, how do I open the box? I, I need a key. And you can't send the key through the courier because the courier might just make a copy of the key, right? Mm. Uh, so right now what happens is uh, I would make two keys. One is more sophisticated, uh, so I can actually open the box with that key. The other key is simpler, and I can only lock the box with that key. And I send the locking key to you through the courier. Mm. And if it makes a copy, it's fine, because it's not going to be able to open the box anyway with that key. Um, so that approach works. Uh, however, there is a chance that a very smart locksmith oh. may be able to guess what the, the, the opening key is based on the locking key. So, so that's the problem. Uh, but quantum key distribution, this quantum communication thing, works totally differently. It, uh, now you, you lock the box using a quantum key and using the, the, uh, the, the weird behavior of quantum mechanics. Um, so if anyone tries to, uh, to examine and copy the key, uh, the key would actually change. So mm. by setting up a protocol between you and me, we'll be able to know if mm. anybody actually attempts to So that's a layman's language enough. But Anton, do you agree with this, this metaphor? And what are the practical challenges making that technology happen, Anton? Well, what we really see here now is that uh, China takes the first steps towards a uh, quantum internet, a worldwide quantum communication uh, uh, method. Uh, uh, what will happen next is I think that uh, China uh, will be put, will put into uh, place various local area networks, as we call them, and connect them with satellite uh, with other continents, including uh, Europe. Uh, I, I, uh, the the, the uh, security of this key, key uh, uh, encryption is, as we just heard, guaranteed by the fact that you cannot copy the key. This is really absolutely important. You cannot listen in, into it without changing it. And Seth, uh, how important is it for future communications? Because I heard uh, there are some Canadian scientists who have tried to copy uh, the messages. Uh, they said that it is not 100 percent unhackable. <clears throat> well, the, yeah, the goal is to construct a uh, quantum communication system which can't be hacked. Of course, there's always um, ways of uh, uh, getting at the people who are receiving the messages. But if you're sending the messages back and forth, as, as uh, uh, Anton just said, um, and somebody looks at it, you can tell how much information they're trying to steal. Um, but the, the systems are complicated, and so you have to be careful that there's not a back door to find out uh, what's going on. The very original quantum cryptography system built by Charlie Bennett at IBM had the feature that you could tell what it was sending because it made a noise, and it would go click, click, and you could hear what the bits were being sent. But I think that the ones that are being uh, constructed in China and elsewhere now are a little more sophisticated than that, and I think that they're very secure. And Mr. Zhang, uh, give us a brief explanation of those uh, words in quantum uh, physics. Quantum communications field, there is quantum key distribution, quantum teleportation, quantum entanglement. Uh, what do these terms mean and why are they important and how is it used in, in quantum communication? Uh, so once again, Anton's the real expert here, but I'll, I'll try to explain. Um, so quantum key distribution is this, this uh, uh, encryption method that's used to uh, to pass along a basically a passphrase uh, for people to, to 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 be able to encrypt and decrypt the uh, the message so nobody can eavesdrop. Um, so quantum. Um, Teleportation is something different. Um, so it's basically for uh, communicating between quantum computers, for example, where the basic computing uh, unit is, is a superposed, so-called superposed quantum state. And it's not a zero or one like in the traditional computer. Mm. So, so when you transmit information, you can't just turn light on and off to represent zero and one. You have to transmit the, uh, the complicated quantum state over. Mm. And that's, uh, that's a kind of technology for, for achieving that. Uh, and, and the uh, quantum entanglement swapping is, is one of the, the ways to, uh, to, to relay message in, in a relay station to, to help uh, achieve this kind of uh, technologies. And we were uh, told that in the science fiction world, uh, 
uh, there might be uh, something that we can imagine, maybe teleport, not just a, a photon or, or a quantum state, but uh, a human being or uh, many other stuff in the real world. Is that possible, uh, Anton? Well, uh, let me make one point clear, namely that teleportation uh, does not teleport the object, but it teleports all the information which you need to uh, uh, put the object together, which is basically uh, the same. If you have all the information, you can reconstruct the object. Now, uh, the, the application of teleportation, as many people expect, will be the communication between future quantum computers. On a worldwide scale even, and the uh, Chinese uh, colleagues of you are doing the first steps now on the worldwide scale. Uh, this is, uh, so the teleportation of information is a key application. If you go to teleportation of larger systems, mm. like including humans, this is still just science fiction. But the we have already the internet. So we can communicate information, information on the you internet we that. have now. Why do we need a quantum exactly. internet for, for communication? Oh, oh, be, oh, because future computers, I expect, will be quantum computers. Maybe in 50 years, I don't know, but the first ones maybe earlier, 20 years. And these computers will be much, much faster than all what you have now. And then to connect them with uh, internet would be just silly because, because uh, uh, these computers uh, uh, will have to, to change the, the, the information from the quantum computer to classical inf uh, information, send it via internet. Mm. It's much better that the information stays, uh, stays quantum and that uh, uh, we, can, we can then uh, 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 stays quantum and we can send the full information yeah. from, from, uh, from uh, one quantum computer to the other one. And if that happens, it's Seth, what, what are the technical and, and technological uh, challenges we have to meet Perfect before we can make that happen, uh, to make quantum communications between quantum computers a reality? Seth? Well, the, uh, the uh, uh, quantum communication satellite that China has, has put up is a great uh, step in the direction of allowing large-scale, uh, long-distance quantum communication between quantum computers. As Anton was saying, um, to connect two quantum computers so they can talk to each other in a quantum mechanical way, uh, you need to teleport quantum information between them. And then this, this makes these computers uh, you know, more like a, a single powerful computer. In the same way that the internet, the classical internet, allows computers to be, be linked together to perform one giant uh, powerful computer, the quantum internet, we hope, will connect together quantum computers to make a global, giant, extremely powerful quantum computer. Mm. Um, and uh, if you can do that, then there are all kinds of wonderful things you can do. For example, you can have in addition to secure communications between two people, you can have provably secure voting where mm. everybody's vote is counts and everybody can tell if their vote has counted. Um, you can have uh, different ways of doing financial transactions where business people can be assured that uh, the uh, contract that they, uh, they've agreed to is being followed, so you can have quantum contracts. You can use these quantum computers to analyze vast quantities of data in a process called quantum machine learning, which allowed them to so find patterns. So it's faster and it, it can be done in a much massive way than we now we are now doing. And you can solve problems that you could never solve with the classical internet. Mm. And um, about a for example, finding patterns of data that you could go ahead that you could right. never find otherwise. And Anton, uh, in an interview with BBC, you said you tried to convince the EU back in 2004 to fund more quantum-based projects, but it had little effect. Uh, more than a decade passed. What do you make of the progress of uh, Europe uh, making headways into this technology? Well, I'm really impressed by, by the Chinese effort and the success because the decisions are made very fast and uh, the work is done by, by very good people. In Europe, the decision processes are too slow. Now Europe is picking up, and I expect that in the future we will have a quantum internet 
you mentioned Canada and many other countries mm -hmm. who will participate in the same way as we have it in the current internet. And what about China, uh, Mr. Zhang? Uh, what is the time frame for China to have a real up and running uh, quantum communications network that can uh, supplant the current communication network we're using? Uh, so uh, I don't speak uh, on behalf of any decision making body, but from my personal uh, estimate, I think, uh, I think in a very short time scale, five to ten, maybe ten years, uh, we will have a, a pretty sizable scale uh, quantum, in the quantum in the information system. Uh, so on top of the, uh, the GNAN uh, local network uh, you mentioned in, at the beginning, uh, there's also a uh, communications mainline between uh, Beijing and Shanghai mm. that's being tested right now. Mm. Uh, that would test the ability okay. to transmit you know, over long distances. So. Uh, all of you are scientists uh, specializing in your areas. How do you think quantum theory and quantum uh, communication might change our way of life and work? Very briefly, we have only 30 seconds for each. Seth? Well, I, if I can say something... Uh, Anton, please. No, Anton first, and then Seth. Okay, uh, I, I, the, ahead, the basic Anton. point is that it will be technology, new technology, it will be new technology, uh, fantastic new technology, but it also will change the way how we think and how we understand ourselves. Seth? Yes, I think that that's the, the, the primary point. We will have secure methods of communication which are useful, but quantum information tells us to think about the world in an entirely different way. Mm -hmm. So I think we'll transform the way scientists and ordinary people think about the world in a way that will allow us to understand things much better than before. And John Fan? Uh, I would concentrate on a more modest expectation. So, um, so the simple, so the simple the fact that the uh, communications become secure is, is very important because um, in the future we'll have automated everything and when you're sitting in a self-driving car you really don't want people to hack into your car and drive you off a cliff so that sort of things basically enables our future uh, so that's a funda fundamental thing that needs to happen uh, so communication helps. both theoretically and practically it will be probably a game changer thank you very much Zhang Fan from Beijing Normal University and Tom Zeilinger uh, from Austria and Seth Lloyd from MIT uh, here is my last point. The interview has reinforced that famous quotation, the more you know, the more you realize how much you don't know. Mankind has ever tried to predict the future and invariably have got it wrong. The problem is that very few of us can think laterally enough to see the possibilities of new ideas. Even the experts get it wrong. Einstein once questioned quantum physics by saying God never plays dice, but in the world of quantum, it seems it does. So in trying to predict the future, everyone could end up looking like an idiot. Even though most of us find quantum physics baffling, I feel much better knowing that these boffins at work to lead mankind onto better things in ways that few of us even have dreamt about till now. And that's it for this edition of The Point. As always, you can follow us on Twitter and visit our Facebook page using the handle at The Point with LX and download the application called CGTN Live to watch our show on the internet. I'm Joe in Beijing. Goodbye.